Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. First, let me say happy holidays to everyone watching this video. The opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about 168 pounds and 175 pounds. I believe this Christmas Eve we need to keep an eye on these divisions for 2014 because I'm expecting big things to happen. I'm expecting there to be consolidation in these two divisions. I'm expecting guys to switch weight classes and challenge other guys for supremacy just as 168 pounder Lucien Boutte is challenging Jean Pascal. Right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to name the top four guys. The four guys who are at the top of the list, at least on my list, right, who I consider to be the best in the two weight classes combined, right? It's a short list. You should question everything. You should question every list that I present to the public, right? This is just one man's opinion. Your opinion is the one that matters, right? But I'm just sharing my thoughts here. I want a robust discussion here in the comment section. I just want you to know where I stand in terms of the fighters I believe rule the roost in these two divisions. We'll call them the top four, right? But before I do that, let me talk about guys who didn't make the top four. Just so you know where I stand on these other world-class fighters. Let me also point out, too, that, you know, styles do make fights, right? The guys who I don't have in the top four aren't bums at all. They're world-class fighters. Who knows? Maybe they will be the last man standing, right? So with that said, guys who didn't make my top four. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., right on his best day, he is one of boxing's premier inside fighters, in my opinion, right? This guy isn't just the son of a legend. He actually has skills, right? He's excellent inside. He's also a very strong puncher. There is some question as to whether his punch will carry to 168 pounds because He's been fighting at 160, apart from the Brian Vera fight, right? But make no mistake, this guy is one of the harder punchers in the sport, right? He hit Sergio Martinez. Sergio Martinez almost didn't get up off the canvas, right? This guy stopped Andy Lee. The power was so pronounced that Andy Lee and Emmanuel Stewart, who was in his corner that night, questioned whether it was authentic, right? This guy has outsized punching power. But, and there's a but, in my opinion, he's out of shape. In my opinion, his volume is getting dangerously low. In my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, he lacks hunger. Right? His dad had to do it the hard way. Chavez is one of these guys who hasn't. Right? And so, unfortunately, in my opinion, in a sport that thrives on hunger, where guys come from nothing and make themselves everything, I don't think this guy has that drive. Another guy who didn't make the list, Carl Frotch. On his best day, he is cagey. I love watching this guy's fights. He outthought Mikael Kessler. Understand, 
As slow as Carl started against George Groves, he starts fast against Mikael Kessler. Right? Carl Frotch makes adjustments. As you watch a Frotch fight, you see him doing different things. Carl Frotch, in my opinion, is mentally one of the sport's toughest guys. Right? Carl Frotch was down against Jermaine Taylor in a fight in the United States. Gets off the canvas. Closes the show. He's down against George Groves. Crowd's going crazy. He gets off the canvas. Didn't have his legs. Goes on to win that fight. Right? This guy is mentally tough. He's also accurate. Right, Carl Frotch, I'll just put it to you this way. He throws a long uppercut. It's not the fastest punch I've seen, but yet it's incredibly effective. Right, this is one of those guys who, quite frankly, is more than the sum of his parts. Right, he's figured things out. He's able to neutralize an opponent's speed. But... He himself has average hand speed at best. But Carl Frotch, in my opinion, is not great inside. But apart from the Kessler fight, Carl Frotch falls behind in fights. Because physically, I don't think he is ready to deal with the speed of an opponent like an Andre Durrell or a George Groves. Right? So Carl Frotch didn't make the list. Let's talk about George Groves. On his best day, he should be on this list. He's a superior athlete. He has superior power. He has superior hand speed. He has superior foot speed. He has great legs. But he's too temperamental. You didn't even see the foot speed against Carl Frotch. In other words, you have to go look at Groves' films to figure out what he can do. Because George Groves gets too caught up in the moment. Starts trading punches with big punchers. The Sierra fight, I thought Groves would have learned not to trade with the big puncher. Yet there he was, looking at beating Carl Frotch. And what's he doing? He's trading with Carl Frotch. Right? Maybe Groves, maybe George Groves will grow out of it and will use all of his talents. But it's very rare when he uses all of his talents. Where was the foot speed he showed in the DeGale fight when he fought Carl Frotch? Let's talk about Jean Pascal. On his best day, he too is a superior athlete. He has a lot of George Groves traits. But... He can be outthought in the ring. We saw it happen twice against Bernard Hopkins. Also, he's great as an ambush fighter. Jumping in like Roy Jones, throwing bombs. He's a big time puncher. But like Roy Jones, he's not a great chess player. Right? He's great when he jumps in and ambushes you. He's not great when you survive the ambush and the fight continues. Also, he's had some shoulder problems. Now, he's a warrior. He's the kind of guy who, and this has happened in a Pascal fight, his shoulder pops out. He has guys in the corner put his shoulder back into place. Right? This guy's a total warrior. The problem is the fact that his shoulder's popping out. Right? One of these days, they won't be able to solve that problem. One of these days, he's going to be in against a guy who sees his shoulder pop out and then who is skillful enough to, to know he's not throwing any hard punches with that arm. right? And then sets up shop where that arm should be taking care of business to Pascal's detriment. Other guys who didn't make the list, Lucien Boutte and Andre Durrell. Let me say this, Butte is a personal favorite of mine. He's great inside. He's an excellent boxer. 
He's beaten more people than you think. He's beaten Sakio Bika. Right? I like how he handled the Labrado Andrade rematch. Took Andrade out from the inside. Right? Hardcore body puncher. Andre Durrell probably has the division's best legs when he's right. But I have concerns about both guys' neurological health. Right? I. Lucien Boutet's legs looked dead to me in that Carl Froch fight after he got hit. Andre Durrell, I'm not sure, has fully bounced back from the damage he suffered at the hands of Arthur Abraham. You may recall he won the fight, he got hit with a cheap shot. I'll tell you what, I, you know, I have concerns. We'll just put it that way. I hope both guys are healthy, but they're not in my top four. A fighter I like who may sound like I'm giving him too much credit here, but I think this guy has all the skills, but he's not in my top four, and that's Marco Antonio Parabin. His biggest problem is that like Billy Kahn, former light heavyweight champion, this guy's too much of a fighter, right? He's kind of like George Grove, same type problem. You're fighting Sakio Bika. You have superior boxing skills. What are you doing engaging in a gunfight with Saki Obika? Come on, man. You know, Paraben, <laughs> Paraben's even been knocked down. You know, he's a bit too reckless for me. I'd like to see the guy slow his roll just a bit. Right? I, you know, just like George Groves, I don't think the focus is fully there. Let's talk about another personal favorite of mine. Chad Dawson, right? I was expecting Chad Dawson to beat Pascal and Adonis Stevenson. In my opinion, like me at times, Chad Dawson is too full of himself. He starts slow against Jean Pascal in Canada. He fights Andre Ward in Andre Ward's weight class. In Andre Ward's hometown. Right? Bad mistakes. And as if that's not bad enough, he then carries his hand low so Andre Ward is repeatedly able to hit him with left hands in the fight, knocking him down several times. So what does Dawson do then? Later he fights Adonis Stevenson in Stevenson adopted country of Canada. And of course, what does he do? He keeps his right low again, and he gets hit with the left hand. When I see a guy who looks like he's on autopilot in fights, that makes me reluctant to pick him. Right? Adonis Stevenson, in my opinion, too one-handed. He has been knocked out in a fight. Right? I believe, and I have no video to prove this, this is just a style thing, I believe that he might be vulnerable to a mobile guy who can operate behind a jab. We shall see. Stevenson is not in my top four, even though he has a title. Saki Obika. He's tough, and he's a big hitter. But in my opinion, he's a predictable mid-range hooker. Like the predictability hurt him against Joe Calzaghe. It hurt him against Lucien Boutte. It hurt him against Andre Ward. He's not in my top four. Anthony Durrell. Looked good against Bika at times. But I have questions about his stamina. I also have questions about his volume. This next guy is a guy who I think is immensely talented. Immensely talented. But I have questions about his attitude and commitment to the sport. Jurgen Bremer. I think he's a superior chess player. He's not in my top four. Right? Bremer's had some personal problems. You can look them up online. So let's talk about my top four. In no particular order. Here are the guys who I think are the four guys who, at least I'm looking at, as ruling the roost at 168 and 175, 
when the bullets start flying. The first is Bernard Hopkins. Yes, he's old. Yes, he lost to Chad Dawson. He is a great defensive fighter. Inside or outside. He can fight you. Inside or outside. If you had to ask me who mentally was the toughest fighter in the sport, I'd probably pick this guy. Right? He can adjust. He can change tempo. It doesn't matter where he's fighting. He's a guy who got off the canvas earlier in his career um, in Ecuador or someplace like that to beat Segundo Mercado. He's a guy who got off the canvas in Canada to get a tie. It was a questionable tie. I thought he won the fight, but they called it a tie against Jean Pascal. Then in the rematch, he beats Pascal handily. It was Pascal who was getting up off the canvas. They called them slips, right? Let's just say Bernard Hopkins is in my final four. Next in my final four is Andre Ward. Now, full disclosure, I've had some business dealings with Andre Ward that have absolutely nothing to do with his greatness as a fighter, right? In my opinion, Andre Ward is a younger Bernard Hopkins with more power. I know there are some people who say, oh, Andre doesn't hit hard enough. Tell that to Chad Dawson. By the way, that is a recent fight. Keep in mind, Andre was out of the ring for a while after that fight and hasn't fought that many times post-Dawson. Just know that Andre Ward knocked out the reigning light heavyweight champion, right? You know, Andre Ward, in my opinion, isn't even fighting his opponents in fights. It looks to me like he's really fighting himself. He's pushing himself. So if you watch the Edison Miranda fight, Andre Ward's dominating that fight. Then Andre decides he wants to come inside on Edison Miranda. In my opinion, Andre's so dominant that Andre's trying out different techniques in fights. There's an interview online where Andre actually talks about how he was surprised when he fought Alan Green, that when he got inside, that Alan wasn't able to make any adjustments. So Andre stayed inside, dominated the fight. That's when you know you're dealing with a great fighter. He's going through his plan A, his plan B, his plan C. Suddenly, plan B works. So of course that fighter says, okay, I'm going to win this fight on plan B unless this guy does something to get me out this groove. Right? Understand Andre was actually prepared to do much more against Alan Green. Right? As good as Andre looks on tape, he might be even better than that. Right? So Andre Ward is on my list. Let me just say, too, a big secret to both Bernard Hopkins and Andre Ward are the long relationships they've had with the guys in their corner, right? Nassim Richardson and Virgil Hunter, right? There's a certain stability with both men that has served both men well. So these guys are able to take on big challenges, right? There's a consistency. This is the opposite of someone like Chad Dawson, who seems to be playing musical chairs with his corner. Right? Now let me just say, the fourth guy, excuse me, I actually missed the page. Let me read my notes here. You know what? I'm missing a page. Let me just talk off the top of my head. The next guy I'm going to mention is Sergei Kovalev. Right? Let me just say this. This guy really impresses me. He's much better than advertised. Many people think he's just a puncher and a brawler. But every fight I've seen of the guy, he's literally patient. Right? I know the end result of the fights. The Cleverly fight, the Salak fight, is short. So you would think he comes out like James Kirkland. In my opinion, he's much better than James Kirkland, right? This guy actually comes out like Prime Tyson, 
right? He's not attacking the opponent. If you look at Tyson against Michael Spinks, that classic from the 80s, heavyweight unification fight, you'll notice even though Tyson got the first round knockout, he's patient. He actually comes out and he's standing around, looking for openings, right? That's Kovalev. Big puncher, not in a rush. Now, if the other guy is silly enough to push the issue, like Nathan Cleverly was, then Kovalev will oblige you. But otherwise, Kovalev is very patient, right? He comes in, he's waiting for his opening. He doesn't just leap into you, he's waiting for his opening. He's two-handed, right? He can throw a jab, but he's really a mid-range hooker. But what's great with him is he actually can box. He actually can counter, right? I think this guy is real. Right? He's a guy you need to look out for. He's very accurate. He knows how to beat long jabbers. Right? Gabriel Campillo destroyed him. Shalak destroyed him. Right? He can beat you because he actually has foot speed and spectacular balance. It doesn't even look like he's winding up for his punches. But yet they're very heavy. You know that because his opponents typically get knocked out. The question with him, and it's unresolved right now, is his stamina. Because I believe only two of his fights have gone the distance. Right, so you do have a stamina issue. The other issue is exactly what will he do? If he fights a guy like Dawson, excuse me, not Dawson, but Andre Ward or Bernard Hopkins, who might come inside and try to smother him. I know it's counterintuitive, but we know being outside and shooting a jab doesn't work against Kovalev because he's too mobile. So the question is, can someone come inside and smother him? That's an open question, right? But Kovalev makes my final four with Hopkins and Ward. Now, the last fighter is going to be the one I get criticized on. <laughs> I'll take the criticism, right? And that's James DeGale. He doesn't have the best jab. Yes, he's arrogant. And it looks to me like he can be roughhoused a bit. You can come in and actually try to rough him up. But... And I don't say this lightly. I'm not betting against him for the next 12 months or until he loses. And that includes fights against the other three members of my final four. This guy has too much talent, right? His feet, in my opinion, and I'm not a trainer, are among the best in boxing. He has the same gift Dmitry Pirog has, where he can change his lead foot, right? He can play foot games because he's ambidextrous, masquerading as a southpaw, right? He also has a three-dimensional game where he can bend his knees and go up and down. When I want to see great boxing, for the last few weeks, I've had the pleasure of just taking out the Dinah Davis, James DeGale tape. The first six rounds, James DeGale, to me, is as good as it gets, right? The talent is obvious, and it's a unique fight style because he's not an ambush fighter, and he's not a jabber. What he is is a master chess player who knows how to use space and distance. He's kind of like Arislandi Lara, right? Only this guy has a certain amount of strategy that I don't think even Lara has, right? So James DeGale is someone who makes my final four. I believe in 12 months, one of these four men is going to have consolidated 
more of a power base than they have right now in the real estate that is 168 right super middleweight and 175 light heavyweight right I believe these four guys are the best in that area code right let me hear from you tell me who I've missed tell me who I've underestimated tell me who I have overestimated in the comment section here to this video right because really these videos are really about public discussion right there have been times here online where I have gotten blown out of the sky right crashed and burned lost both sides of a betting hedge right so don't take my word as gospel what I'm trying to do here is actually cultivate discussion and get people thinking right this final four list has a guy who as I said James DeGale doesn't have the best jab has a guy who's only gone the distance twice in his career right Sergei Kovalev right has a guy who just had major surgery and was out for a while and has only had one fight since then in Andre Ward and of course has a guy <laughs> who's in his late 40s in Bernard Hopkins are those guys the best at 168 to 175 you tell me let me just tell you too that I read the comments to this video and I've learned a lot I learn a lot about boxers from the comment section here my goal is to get an edge on the casino and often I'll read a comment and I'll say wow I didn't think of that let me look up that fighter let me look up that fight let me watch film right so you have my opinion I hope you share yours here online with the YouTube community I'd like to hear from you thanks for indulging me Merry Christmas Happy New Year Happy holiday season. Happy Kwanzaa. Thanks for stopping by.